You ready to start? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Sorry, there's okay. some muting issues in here. Okay. Okay, everyone, um, welcome to the three minute thesis final round for the PhDs. Um, I am your host, Kayla Seymour. I am a PhD student at the University of Delaware, and I'm joined by my co host. Hi, I'm Sylvia Blemker. I'm a professor of biomedical engineering at the University of Virginia. Hey, and we are pleased to present you the final round of the PhD three minute thesis competition. Um, this competition challenges our graduate students to explain their research in an engaging and concise presentation that's accessible to non technical audiences. So following a very competitive qualifying and preliminary round, we're excited to have our 12 finalists presenting live during this virtual be uh, virtual ASB. 2020 meeting. Um, how the session will work is our host will briefly introduce our finalists and then the finalists will have three minutes to present their research to our audience. In addition to the winner and runner up determined by our judges, the audience members will have a chance to vote for a People's Choice Award winner at the end of the session. So be sure to stick around for that. Um, so they're doing the next slide there. Awesome. All right, so um, our finalists are listed here. Um, and like I said, uh, be able to stick around for the People's Choice Award at the end. And then next, we just have some quick uh, Zoom recommendations for viewing. All right, so before we begin, um, if you're not already, please switch your viewing setting from a gallery to a speaker view. Um, you can find that in the upper right hand corner of your Zoom screen. And then uh, to best view the presentation slides. We also recommend having the speakers window in the top right corner of your screen. Um, the slide will have a lot of information on it and we don't want you the speakers window to cover up any of that information. Uh, we also request that everyone stay muted during this session as a courtesy to our presenters. If you have any technical issues that happen, you can send a private message to Sylvia or I and someone will assist you. And then lastly, we wanna point out that there won't be a live Q&A during this session, uh, but you can interact with our presenters on the Three Minute Thesis Slack channel, and I will post that in the chat. Um, all right, I think that's all the logistics, uh, so I will turn it back over to Sylvia uh, to introduce our first finalist. All right, our first finalist is uh, Rebecca Kane from The Ohio State University. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca and this is Molly. Molly is 65 and loves to garden, but she has severe knee osteoarthritis, which is marked by the painful degeneration of her knee cartilage. This orthopedic condition makes it difficult to go up and down stairs, stand up out of a chair, and it prevents Molly from kneeling in her garden. Soon, Molly will undergo surgery to replace her knees, joining the hundreds of thousands of Americans who receive this surgery, who receive this surgery every year. And each of you watching at home right now are actually in the process of developing this age-related condition as I speak. And many of you will eventually need knee replacements. Unfortunately, one in five patients are dissatisfied with the outcomes of this surgery and Molly doesn't want to be one of them. Previous research on improving surgery and recovery has focused on what techniques the surgeons use, the shape of the implants, the motion of the knee, muscle strength, and many other factors. But we still don't have a clear answer on why so many patients are dissatisfied. Rather than focusing on mechanics, I came at this problem from a new angle, with neuroscience. When we walk, our nervous systems send messages from the brain and the spinal cord down to the muscles. Rather than controlling muscles individually, I study how the nervous system controls muscles in groups, like those in green, blue, and purple on the screen. And we call these groups modules. If our nervous systems use the wrong modules at the wrong times, we have trouble walking. My work focuses on using this neuroscience combined with engineering techniques to learn more about why people like Molly aren't able to move like they want to. First, I wanted to know what Molly's module groups looked like and if it was possible for them to change. So I studied modules and walking ability in patients before and after knee replacement surgery. And I learned that patients who improved in walking ability throughout recovery also had changes in which module groups they used at certain times. This means that they naturally reorganize their nervous systems throughout recovery. 
Considering changes like this usually occur over decades or as the result of brain injury, this was a surprising finding in people with an orthopedic condition. And it made me wonder if it's possible to intentionally change modules. I'm in the process of investigating whether or not we can challenge the nervous system to reorganize itself so that it activates the right module groups at the right times. One way to challenge the nervous system is by resisting and limiting joint movement. So using a combination a combination of experiments on the treadmill and computer simulations, I'll study how joint resistance as well as muscle strength and walking ability may be related to muscle control and modules. While my work is ongoing, the findings could open opportunities for new and novel rehabilitation programs for people with orthopedic conditions, even beyond knee osteoarthritis. We may be able to target specific changes in the nervous system in order to improve patient outcomes and help people like Molly get back to their favorite activities. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next speaker is uh, Sarah Hood from uh, uh, the University of Utah. Hello, there are over 7 billion humans, you and me, living on this planet. And despite this large number, not one of us is exactly the same. Each one of us is unique in the way that we look, sound, think, and walk. And this high variability among humans is both exciting and extremely challenging. My goal is to help individuals suffering from limb loss to gain better mobility. I'm working to design intelligent prosthetics that can restore the full functionality of an intact human leg. But every person is unique, which means every person gets hurt differently and these injuries affect them differently, affecting how they walk differently. So how do we build robotic legs for each individual? First, we need to better understand current prostheses. How can some amputees walk and jump, but others struggle to get up out of a chair? Each individual is unique, unique in their strength, unique in their mobility, and unique in their biomechanics. I want to build intelligent prostheses that can adapt to the uniqueness of its user. So I set out to build a data set to understand the variability in how amputees walk. In the last two years, I have worked with 18 individuals, each with a unique above knee amputation, a unique walking pattern, and a unique clinical need. They were divided into two groups based on their activity level, and each group was asked to walk at five different speeds while using their at-home passive prosthesis. Each individual wore 67 reflective markers for a full body modified plug and gate model. Using a motion capture system and an instrumented treadmill, I have quantified the kinematics and kinetics for this diverse set of amputees. But how can this data set improve the life of individuals with amputations? I am trying to quantify and understand the variability in the cues of the user. So the intelligent prosthesis can predict the intention of the user and adapt each step to the unique needs of its unique user. This data set has the potential to answer many questions across many different fields of expertise. Engineers like me can use this information to better understand how amputees walk at different speeds. Physical therapists can use it to improve rehabilitation techniques based on which joints are working the hardest. Physicians and clinicians can use this data when prescribing a prosthesis to a unique individual. So I made this data set openly available. Many people have downloaded it and some have asked us to collaborate with them on their research goals. Making data openly available will make the field of biomechanics more accessible to everyone, including those who may not have access to the resources to collect this data. Each and every one of us is a unique individual with a unique background. This data set contains the answers to unique research questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Our next speaker is Christina Lee from the University of Michigan. I'm sure many of you remember that time when Luke Skywalker lost his arm from a lightsaber. To our surprise, Luke was able to control his new robotic arm or a prosthesis so effortlessly that we forgot that he was missing an arm for the rest of the movie. Unfortunately, that is far from the truth today. There are currently more than 41,000 individuals with a major upper limb loss in the United States, and most of them rely on a prosthesis that only allows them to open and close the hand, while others choose not to use a prosthesis at all. Because of this, 
they have to rely exclusively on their intact limb or make compensations to move with the prosthesis. This puts them at an additional risk of developing secondary repetitive stress injuries in the proximal arm, neck, and back. To address this limitation, our group at the University of Michigan has been focusing on developing ways to achieve a better control of upper limb prostheses that is useful in completing daily tasks both effectively and intuitively. As a part of this effort, researchers and clinicians here have develop, developed the Regenerative Peripheral Nerve Interfaces, or RPNIs, where a tiny piece of muscle is wrapped around the individually separated nerve endings, almost like a burrito. This piece of muscle is then revascularized and re innervated by the nerve. The system acts like an amplifier for the small signals that are still being transmitted down the nerve. We surgically implanted indwelling electrodes directly into these RPNIs, as well as the residual muscles in two individuals with upper limb loss below the elbow. Signals from these RPNIs have high signal to noise ratio, similar to what you would see in intact muscles. This is consistently true even after our over 300 days of observation. We have also shown that these signals can be used to control a virtual prosthetic hand on a computer screen, as well as a physical prosthetic hand consistently over time for almost a year following wire surgery. This is particularly exciting as this is the first time that researchers are able to record the amplify signals originating from the nerve to control a prosthesis consistently. I am currently evaluating whether prosthesis users who have received these RPNIs are able to make smooth movements with decreased trunk and upper limb compensations. Specifically, I have analyzed movement kinematics during functional tasks, such as the box and blocks test of manual dexterity, the Southampton hand assessment procedure that assesses hand function with multiple grasp patterns, as well as a series of activities of daily living. From this, we found that our participant was able to use one grasp at a time to complete these functional tasks consistently. We are in the process of providing additional grasp patterns as well as wrist motion and determining whether this allows our prosthesis users to make movements with decreased compensations. Moving forward, I plan to further analyze and assess the biomechanical and functional advantages of RPNIs, including decreased cognitive load and improved movement quality. Through this work, my goal is to one day eliminate the physical disability that exists with upper limb loss today. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Our next speaker is V. Tran from the University of Virginia. Thank you, Sylvia, for the introduction and thank you for having me today. So about 10 years ago, my little niece, Bella, who's on the screen next to me, was born with a condition called cleft palate. And like many people, I assumed it was gonna be a separation on her lip. I quickly learned then that cleft palate actually occurred when the roof of the mouth failed to fuse together and this leaves a gap between the nose and the mouth region. It's actually one of the most common birth defects that affecting one in 700 children worldwide, that included here in America. Now imagine yourself drinking out of a milk carton with a straw, but there's a big cut out on that straw. Most of you would already think, well, it would not work. And you're right, it would not. But that also the sad reality for millions of baby born with cleft palate. These baby cannot generate any suction because of the cleft opening and have to rely on the use of specialized bottle or feeding tube. And even with that, baby born with cleft palate still struggle in weight gain and many feeding complications. So the first part of my thesis is to design and clinically evaluate a new baby bottle for kids with cleft palate. The new bottle design utilize the tongue and the jaw movement in place of suction to withdraw fluid from the bottle. And from the preliminary data, we learned that our bottle has significantly lower incidence of complication and higher rate in usability. In the US, a baby born with cleft palate will have the repair surgery at around a year of age, where the speech outcome of this surgery won't be evaluated until they start talking around three to five years old. In a healthy speech condition, the soft palate can elevate and move back to reach the back of the throat and create a full velopharyngeal closure in which there no air escape through the nose during speech. Nevertheless, one in four cleft repair surgery fell with complications that negatively impact the speech production and a portion of them require additional corrective surgery. So the second goal of my thesis is to utilize 3D computational modeling along with MRI data to be a subject specific model in both healthy population and in children with repair cleft palate. We use these models to study how anatomical variation impact closure function and also gain insight on parameters that are not feasible to access in clinic. 
We also ran hypothetical simulation to determine and optimize factor that could impact closure function post-corrective surgery. Together, these knowledge provide a framework for future surgical planning and clinical management. Even in this modern day of medicine, day-to-day -day activities that are fitting in speed still remain a challenge in the standard of care for kids with cleft palate. My thesis with combine biomedical design principle and computational modeling can contribute to the quest to find solutions to this problem and hopefully improve the quality of life of many babies, just like my little niece. Thank you. Thank you, V. Our next speaker is uh, Janneke Schwanner from the University of Idaho. Animals are top athletes. For example, cheetahs can sprint up at 75 miles per hour, and American pronghorns have an estimated marathon time of just 45 minutes. Extreme behaviors like these might imply that human performances are less impressive, although I will never run a marathon under two hours, but it made me wonder why animals move and look the way they do. We are all limited in our performance, some definitely more than others, but certain animals have found ways to trick the system and circumvent mechanical limitations. The 100 gram fluff ball with its tiny T-Rex arms, its large muscular hind legs, and its long bendy tail, you see here, mid-air, is a kangaroo rat. This bipedal hopping rodent uses erratic vertical leaps over 10 times its hip height to evade snakes. Such performance requires extraordinary amount of power that exceed the physical limits of what muscles alone can produce. My research revealed that kangaroo rats trick the system by using their Achilles tendon in two distinct ways. Simultaneously. Firstly, as a strut-like structure to transfer energy from powerful thigh and back muscles. And secondly, as a compliance structure to decouple shortening velocities in the calf muscles, allowing these muscles to operate under near optimal conditions for power production. And an exciting consequence of this jumping behavior is that it allows for time to rotate in the air. My study showed that kangaroo rats use the tail by bending and twisting it around the body to actively change the direction it's facing, comparable to a, a gymnast or a diver that move arms around to twist slower or faster. Outcomes of my research provide a foundation for understanding principles governing the mechanics of extreme behavioral phenomena and explore the limits of performance. For example, Understanding power production and elastic energy storage and recovery in terrestrial locomotion has applications for robotic and prosthetic designs. Studying how kangaroo rats use active control of their tail to reorient in the air elucidates potential evolutionary purposes of this appendage or the loss thereof. It also sets the stage for future bio-inspired designs of dynamic robotic devices that use appendages to control balance and orientation. Thank you. Thank you, Janneke. Our next speaker is Ricky Pimentel from the joint program of the University of North Carolina and the uh, NC State uh, University. Hi everyone, my name is Ricky Pimentel and I'm representing UNC Chapel Hill and NC State. My goal is to help people age gracefully so they can stay active and healthy throughout their lifetime. Compared to the young, older adults require more energy to walk at the same speeds, which impacts their endurance and independence. A major theory on this higher metabolic cost is this shift of muscle work from muscle spanning the ankle to those at the hip. When shifting muscle work, older adults tend to rely more on muscles with longer fibers and shorter tendons. This requires older adults to perform more active muscle contraction and less passive tendon stretch and recoil, which may lead to higher metabolic costs by literally taking the spring out of their step. When young adults push off the ground with less force while walking, they redistribute their muscle work just like older adults. 
So we wanted to test this shift in muscle demand theory in young adults because we can control for other age-related changes that affect walking economy. It's not really feasible to measure the metabolic cost of individual muscles during walking, so we used musculoskeletal models to calculate the muscle forces required to generate movement, and then estimate the metabolic cost of each muscle individually, accounting for muscle fiber length, activation level, and tendon elasticity. We asked young adults to walk at their typical speed while targeting their normal push-off or propulsive force, as well as 20 and 40% lower than normal, shown in blue. We also asked them to complete trials of 20 and 40% larger than normal propulsive force, shown in orange, but we don't discuss that data here. We recorded their motions and forces during these trials and also measured how much oxygen they consumed to calculate their actual metabolic cost. Our model estimates of walking economy explain about one third of the variance in directly measured metabolic cost. The metabolic cost of walking increased when targeting smaller propulsive forces, just like older adults mainly explained by muscle spanning the hip and the knee. The increased cost of muscle spanning the hip when targeting smaller propulsive forces mainly occurred during early stance. With less ankle push-off, the leading limb's hamstring muscles have to work harder to maintain forward progress with each step. During leg swing, targeting 40% smaller propulsive forces led to higher metabolic cost to operate muscles spanning the knee. The quadriceps had to overcome insufficient ankle push-off by performing more work to swing your leg forward and straighten it before the next foot strike. Our work highlights the importance of the ankle push-off during walking and how muscle compensation at other joints leads to higher metabolic costs, even in young adults. We need to find ways to maintain ankle power capacity using rehab therapies and assistive devices. Ultimately, this would improve walking economy in older adults so they can keep moving forward with active and healthy lives. Great, thank you, Ricky. Next up is Emily Kane, and she is from North Carolina State University. Hi. Oop. Can we go back? Um, during the short time that I'm speaking today, about five people will have a stroke somewhere in the U.S. For most survivors, a stroke causes weakened muscles on one side of the body, which limits their mobility and therefore their quality of life. I'm interested in restoring mobility following a stroke using wearable robotics that work at the joint level to improve walking function. First part of my research includes an adaptive ankle exoskeleton which applies power at the ankle according to the user's measured calf muscle activity, as well as their walking speed. We were successful in this research in increasing the total ankle power using this device. However, it didn't improve the forward propulsion or reduce the metabolic cost as we had anticipated. So after some additional analysis, we found out that the position of the leg during exo assistance was more vertical. So our assistance ended up pushing the body up instead of forward. In other words, while our device did address the weakness of the ankle, it didn't address changes in coordination that occur following a stroke. So this caused us to rethink our approach. Are we applying assistance to the right joint? It's difficult to know where assistance would be most beneficial because ankle and knee and hip motion are all interrelated. So we went back to a basic science drawing board and we devised an experiment that would let us explicitly decouple ankle weakness and knee weakness, both of which are important in post-stroke gait. We found that we could use ankle bracing, then knee bracing, then ankle and knee bracing simultaneously on healthy controls to restrict range of motion and reproduce post-stroke gait characteristics, including increased circumduction of the foot, as well as decreased propulsion. We also found that in any condition where the ankle was restricted, the metabolic cost of walking or the energy it takes to walk was increased when compared to no restrictions. Because knee restriction didn't produce more exhaustive walking, we think that ankle-based interventions and rehabilitation hold more promise for making walking easier. Interestingly, in this really basic science experiment, the changes in mechanics that we saw didn't well predict the changes in metabolic cost. That suggested that the metabolic changes might be more related to muscle level changes in timing and coordination. After all, research has shown the importance of the timing and magnitude of propulsion of the paretic leg, leg on metabolic cost. So the next research that we're conducting includes an ankle exoskeleton that changes the timing of assistance 
as a way to manipulate coordination and the magnitude of assistance as a way to manipulate the walking mechanics. We hope that the results of this research will provide guidance for future exo designs and that it will propel this science one step closer towards improving mobility for stroke survivors and enabling them to participate more fully in their community for decades. Thank you so much. Great talk, Emily. Uh, next up, we have Scott Ulrich from Stanford University. You're good to go Imagine somewhere. you're 50 years old and just finished playing basketball with your kids. That night, your knee begins to ache, and in the coming months, the pain becomes persistent during walking. Your doctor diagnoses you with osteoarthritis. She gives you a steroid injection and recommends physical therapy and ibuprofen. You then ask the inevitable question, will it ever get better? And she reluctantly responds, you will likely need a knee replacement in five to 10 years. You have now joined the 30 million other Americans with osteoarthritis, navigating through symptom management towards the imperfect endpoint of a joint replacement. My PhD work focuses on a non-surgical treatment for knee osteoarthritis called gait retraining that aims to reduce pain and delay or even prevent the need for a knee replacement. By changing the way that people walk or how they coordinate their muscles during walking, gait retraining reduces the large forces transmitted through the knee which are related to both pain and disease progression. I began by developing a real-time biofeedback system to teach people to change their foot angle during walking. 69 individuals with knee osteoarthritis then enrolled in a clinical trial to investigate the efficacy of pers a personalized foot angle modification that reduces knee loading compared to a sham gait retraining control. After six weeks of gait retraining, the intervention group improved their pain by 40%, which was twice that of the control group. These results are promising, but they hinge on our ability to select a personalized foot angle modification that improves each individual's knee loading. Now this process requires an expensive gait analysis laboratory that is not available in a clinical setting. To address this problem, I developed an algorithm that will soon facilitate the estimation of knee loading using just a cell phone camera. Computer vision algorithms, like the one shown here, can recognize human joint positions from a video. So I developed a machine learning model to predict knee loading using these positions. Soon, clinicians may be able to prescribe personalized gait modifications just from videos of their patients walking. Another way to reduce knee loading during walking is to change how we coordinate our muscles. Using computer simulations of the musculoskeletal system, I found that changing how we coordinate our two major calf muscles could reduce knee loading. After just 15 minutes of biofeedback of their muscle activity, healthy individuals were able to adopt this new coordination pattern and reduce their knee loading by 38% of their body weight. These gait modifications are promising non-surgical treatments for knee osteoarthritis. They take us one step closer to a future where individuals with osteoarthritis no longer need to ask, how long until I need a joint replacement? And instead can ask, which disease modifying treatment is best for me? Great talk, Scott. Uh, next up, we have Josh Leonardis and he is from the University of Michigan. Tina was the first patient I interacted with at the start of my doctoral program at the University of Michigan. The surgical procedure that saved Tina's life left her with chronic shoulder pain and weakness and the inability to perform even the most basic activities of daily living. You see, Tina had her breast cancer managed with mastectomy and post-mastectomy breast reconstruction. Mastectomy is a highly invasive surgical procedure that removes the entire breast in order to eradicate any cancerous tissue, while breast reconstruction is performed after mastectomy in order to return the look and feel of natural breast tissue. Post-mastectomy breast reconstruction often requires the surgical removal of the pectoralis major and or latissimus dorsi muscles from their bony attachments in order to reshape the breast mound or to provide coverage for a synthetic implant. These muscles are rarely, if ever, reattached, so it should come as no surprise that Tina's outcomes are not unique. As many as 90% of women that undergo mastectomy and breast reconstruction will experience quality of life deficits or self-report shoulder morbidity. 
However, there's virtually no information regarding how different breast reconstruction choices influence shoulder biomechanics. This has led to poor detection of patients suffering from shoulder morbidity, ineffective physical rehabilitation protocols, and ultimately compromised post-treatment quality of life. The purpose of my dissertation was to explore the physiological mechanisms contributing to the physical deficits experienced by breast reconstruction patients by utilizing biomechanical assessments of shoulder joint and muscle function. I found that the disinsertion of the pectoralis major or latissimus dorsi muscles not only reduce shoulder strength, but also influence shoulder stiffness, which means women will suffer chronic weakness and joint instability. My, first, my work was the first to explore the pathophysiological mechanisms driving these deficits. I found that reduced shoulder strength and stiffness is driven in part by reduced contributions from the pectoralis major and latissimus dorsi muscles and changes to how the central nervous system controls the other remaining intact muscles of the shoulder. Finally, I found that measures of shoulder joint and muscle biomechanics can be used as predictors of patient quality of life, emphasizing their utility as a means to monitor patient health. The results of my work have broad clinical implications. They can be used to optimize breast reconstruction procedures to minimize muscle loss, and they can inform the development of physical rehabilitation protocols by function to, functions to restore and individual shoulder muscles to target. My work is also broadly applicable to other clinical situations where shoulder musculature are surgically manipulated, such as in reconstructions of the head and the neck or of the lower extremity. My work has leveraged methods long familiar to biomechanists like us in order to improve the lives of breast cancer survivors. As I move forward, I'm focused on assuring people like Tina never have to sacrifice quality of life for survival. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Next up, we have Megan Kaczynski, and she's from Penn State University. Let's go for a walk. We can go for a walk around your neighborhood. If your neighborhood is anything like mine, along the way, we might slow down so that we can chat with a neighbor. Perhaps we'll just barely dodge a bicyclist who's come barreling towards us then we'll probably have to step around some twigs and loose gravel that's scattered along the sidewalk. While walking, we face challenges like these constantly. And as humans, we have the remar remarkable ability to change the way that we walk step by step so that we can multitask, avoid injuries, and maintain balance. Now, our capacities to do these things tend to change as we age. So for someone over the age of 65, Walking while talking, quickly avoiding hazards, and accurately stepping around objects, these things remain critical, but they tend to become quite difficult. And as these abilities decline, so too can quality of life and health. Did you know that some aspects of the way that we walk can actually be used to predict how long we're going to live? So to ensure that people can walk as well as possible, as long as possible, my research explores how aging impacts the way that we change our steps to deal with these sorts of balance challenges. You see, aging doesn't simply make us worse at walking. In one of my studies, I found that when people have similar physical and cognitive abilities, whether they're 18 or they're 70, they similarly change the way that they take their steps to maintain balance, even when we're literally shaking the ground beneath their feet. So rather than simply looking at age as, indi as, an, as an indication of walking balance, I look at the specific aspects of aging that most affect the ways that we choose to take our steps. Aging can impact walking balance in many ways, and I've indicated a few of them here. Aging can create deficits in physical ability, things like reduced mobility and strength. Aging can create a discrepancy between what we think we can do perceived ability, and what we can actually do. Aging is also associated with an increased fear of falling. So I've recently shown that rather than age itself, it's really these aspects of aging that most affect the way that people change their steps to do things like walk on narrow paths or move left, then right. With the work that I'm doing, I hope to inform and focus rehabilitative and preventative approaches to improving balance as we age. This will ensure that people can walk as well as possible, as long as possible, 
one step at a time. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Next up, we have Megan Mancuso, and she's from Worcester Polytech Institute. My research is focused on how exercise causes bone structure to adapt and become stronger. So sometimes I'm asked, what exercises should I be doing? How about my mom or my daughter? And these are great questions because a woman is more likely to break her hip than to be diagnosed with breast, ovarian, or uterine cancers combined. And fractures can lead to loss of mobility, extended hospital stays, and increased risk of death. And my answer to everyone is, high impact resistive exercise is generally best for bone. But I'm frustrated because this is roughly the same answer we had 20 years ago. In an era of personalized medicine, there are no evidence-based approaches for tuning exercises to individuals. And the key is just millimeters out of reach, beneath your skin and muscle, which prevents us from knowing how force is applied outside your body or felt by the 42 billion cells inside your skeleton. With each step, your bone tissue deforms a fraction of a percent, pumping fluid through microscopic tunnels in your bone, carrying signals that tell cells where tissue should be added or removed to maintain healthy loading. And we know in animal models that bone deformation controls adaptation to mechanical loading, but in humans, we can't measure this deformation safely. This means that researchers don't know how much bone loading they're applying with their interventions and have no real basis to compare, say, running in adolescence to step aerobics in 65-year-olds. And as a result, we don't know how much bone loading is enough or whether this threshold varies between individuals. So my work takes a different approach. I use a simple model exercise, leaning on and off the palm of the hand to deliver controlled cyclic forces to the forearm bones. And I apply these forces to 3D computer models generated from CT scans of a patient's unique bone structure, allowing me to estimate bone tissue deformation during forearm loading. For my dissertation, I use data from a clinical study in which 48 healthy adult women perform loading for 12 months. And I correlated bone structural changes to local tissue deformation within bone struts less than half a millimeter thick. And for the first time in humans, we showed that bone formation is associated with high deformation and bone resorption is associated with low deformation. And this supports our hypothesis that local bone tissue loading drives adaptation to exercise in humans. Looking forward, this approach can be applied to other bones and exercises. By providing an objective, comparable measure of bone loading relevant to the biological mechanism of adaptation, we will allow researchers to collaborate more effectively and help move our field forward toward personalized exercise prescriptions. And my ultimate hope is that this work will help to keep you, your mothers, and your daughters safe and healthy in the future. Thank you. Great, thank you, Megan. And our last talk is by Kay Song, and he's from Washington University in St. Louis. All right, thanks to everybody for staying, staying around. So hope my hip will work on the lab computer. If you look at my title and think, what do you even mean? What I want you to think about is uh, what happens to your hip when you walk. Every day as we move around, our hips are loaded with forces. Now this might sound like nothing special, but for a hip with abnormal shape of the bones, repetitive abnormal loading could wear down the joint after a while. Abnormal hip bony shapes are known as hip dysplasia, and the patients frequently suffer from diseases such as uh, labral tears and early arthritis. We want to understand better why the abnormal shape of the bones will cause abnormal loading. But how are we going to know what the loading inside the hip looks like during real life activities such as walking? That's gonna be hard, but that's why the lab computer comes to play because we can use computational models to estimate those forces. We want our models to work on the lab computer just like real patients. So we collect subject specific data such as 3D motion using the camera system that people use to make Iron Man movies. And we also collect the MR data, which we can build 3D shape models of the bones, just like the example you can see on the middle of my slide. Now look at these slides. What else can you see on the model? What are the red lines? These red lines are muscles. Muscles generate a lot of forces inside the joint. So their um, roles could be important for hip dysplasia as well. 
And using the model specifically built for the dysplasia patients, we found that uh, the location of the hip joint center was moving closer to the hip muscles which means the same muscle will have to generate more forces to move a hip with dysplasia. Just like if you imagine, imagine to put your hand too close to the hinge of a door, you'll have to push harder to open it. We also found from the model that the direction of the hip muscles changed because of hip dysplasia, which could change the amount of forces located at the different parts of the abnormally shaped hip bones. And to verify this, we further used our models to estimate the, the loading at the edge of the shallow hip socket and found that the front and the upper part of the hip socket was heavily loaded, which happens to be the parts that frequently suffer from labral tears. So hopefully uh, these examples can convince you that the models can help us estimate forces we cannot directly measure. And we hope our results can guide the future treatments on hip dysplasia in a subject specific way. So the patients will no longer have to hold their hips when they walk, run, and have fun anywhere they want. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our final round for the PhD three minute thesis competition. Uh, we like to thank our finalists and our judges for all their hard work. And now we encourage you all to vote for your favorite finalists to win the People's Choice Award. The poll should be open on your screen. Uh, you'll see that the finalists are listed in presentation order. Please select your winner first and then indicate the group you did not select a winner from. Right, so you have to select two options there. Uh, all of our winners will be announced at the closing ceremony on Friday, so, so be sure to attend that. And we hope you enjoyed this competition. Uh, as a reminder, uh, we have interactions with our presenters that will be offline in the three minute thesis slack channel and uh, that will be posted in our chat room. Thanks everyone for attending. Just wanted to say to all the speakers, that was amazing. You guys are all um, doing awesome work and I'm just really impressed by your ability to present your research in a, such a clear and exciting way. So congratulations to you all. Yeah, it's been a great experience uh, collaborating with everyone to get the three minute thesis running. So great job, everybody. If you're not looking on a chat, you guys should look on the chat because there's lots of fun comments there. Just a reminder for everybody who hasn't voted yet to get your vote in. I'm gonna close the poll in a couple seconds here.
All right, we're gonna go ahead and end the, the poll. Thanks everyone again for competing, for judging, for attending the session, and hopefully we'll see you guys at the closing ceremony. Just let me know, Sylvia, um, Kayla, if you, when you want me to close the meeting. Hold on, just one little bit. I'm going to take a picture of the results. Yeah, yes, no problem. As well. Not rushing you at all. I'm around for a while. All right, I, I think we're good. Did you get a picture, Kayla? We got yep. double, double takes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, that was that was a lot of fun. I'm gonna stop my screen share. Thanks to everybody. Thank you. Thanks.